right, everybody, I guess it's time to, to get started. We're a little bit overdue, but I think it's all right. So my name is Chris Gavey. You probably got the, well, some of you. You didn't because you just signed up. But most of you got the email blast from me about all the stuff to get set up. Hopefully, everybody's up and running. I know here at Visionist, we're really excited at this turnout. This is pretty awesome. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker, Enrique. Enrique is going to start everything off with a little lightning talk just to get your taste buds ready to go for React. I'm going to be pressing two buttons, so let's see how this goes. Cool. So yeah, uh, I'm actually super excited about today because hopefully you guys will be able to leave here like with a little bit more knowledge about React and. You know, trigger something in your curiosity and go home and you're like, hey, I want to write all this stuff in React. So let's get started. Um, I'm Enrique. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Enrique. I've been here at Visionist for a little over a year. I've been playing around and working with React for about eight, nine months. Eight, nine solid months. Like in my spare time and at work. And it's been pretty crazy. It's been a big ride. So I've been able to learn new stuff. It's shaped how I see JavaScript, how I write JavaScript. I've been able to like do a lot of really cool stuff because React has a lot of friends that Mark will talk about later. Um, so yeah, uh, to let you guys know how I feel about React, it's this pretty much. Like if software is eating the world and JavaScript is eating software and React is eating JavaScript, like this is the most biased slide in the whole presentation. <laughs> Moving along. So let's talk a little bit about JavaScript. So JavaScript has always been a mess. And like JavaScript's been that little kid in the back nobody really likes. Um, but us a special few, we kind of look at it, we like it no matter what. Um, and yeah, so jumping into a regular JavaScript application has always been hard because custom code structures and varying trends, et cetera, and you know what, it kind of still is, but who cares? Um, it's JavaScript is always going to be like that probably for a while, and you know, what we can hope for is it's continued improvement uh, of its developer experience, and that's where React really shines, that's where React comes along. So React came in, introduced a lot of cool stuff like the like many new innovations like the virtual DOM, but most importantly, it introduced a uh, unifying trend. Um, it seems to be guiding, like this trend in particular seems to be guiding every other library or framework out there to the same direction. And here is a quote that kind of like, for some dude in Quora that I found. Uh, many new trends in the way we work or would like to work in the front end community have been condensed in React. It's like, cool, a trend, new trend, what trend? Components, like everything, everything is delved into components. Everything, <laughs> components, components, components. So yeah, you can see it's a big deal. Um, what is a component? Uh, components are the reusable building blocks for React. It's self-sustained. Everything's in one component: your functions, your CSS, and your HTML markup. And the cool thing about this makes things super modular and makes it even easier to develop your stuff, making JavaScript development better. Um, when you hook up React, your project, along with many of its cool friends, uh, you get a re really cool, very luxurious development environment. Uh, like you get like hot reloading where you can like edit your code in an editor, save your file, and it'll automatically push your stuff to the browser, uh, maintaining state, and that's the best part of it. Um, but yeah, and to wrap it up, uh, these are a few of the companies that are using React in their websites. So you can see the community's big on this, like Facebook's really behind React. And so are we. So yeah, hope you guys have fun, and thank you. All right, and next up is Mark, and Mark's going to be doing the real uh, meat and potatoes here. We're going to get down and dirty with React right now. Down and dirty. You want to go uh, full screen? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go full screen? All right. So, like KV said, thank you guys all for coming today. We've uh, been talking about this for a couple months and we're really excited that it's finally here. Um, can everybody actually hear me in the back? Good, all right. So, we're gonna do an introduction to React here. And what we're gonna do is basically introduce you guys to, like uh, Enrique was talking about, the basic building blocks of React, which is the components. Um, components kind of know everything that they need to know to put something on the screen. So if you update the data that a component has, it will update the screen. Um, so we'll have a few uh, exercises for you guys to do, and we'll go through a few exercises on the screen together too. Um, 
All right, so hey, I'm Mark. I don't think I introduced myself yet. I work here at Visionist. Um, I've been using React at various projects for the last year, probably. Um, and so if you get help today, or if you need help today, please raise your hand and we will like come around. Um, if you've used React before, can you raise your hand right now? So these are the people you want to be talking to if you need help. Um, if you've used React, please go around the room, help people out, um, whatever knowledge you have. All right, so like I talked about before, we're going to start out with not exactly React. So Enrique mentioned React and Friends. Um, there's a few tools that we use to make developing in React much more fun and uh, approachable. Um, so we'll talk about those, we'll talk about components, and then what makes a component, the props, the state, and the component lifecycle. All right, um, this presentation is built with React. So as you notice, it's in your browser. You use uh, npm run dev and ran the application, and now you're looking at it. Um, so it's a presentation application. If you guys wanted to look at the code, you can start at source index.js and just kind of follow the dependency and the requires from there. Um, yeah. All right, so what makes this application? The first thing is Webpack. So Webpack basically bundles all of your client source, client side dependencies and creates one file that you can then send to the browser. So that allows us to put all of our React components, all of our helper functions, everything in different uh, files and keep everything really organized. Um, it also lets us write in things like JSX and less instead of JS and CSS, um, which you'll see is a huge advantage here. So that's the new buzzword, right? Transpilation. Um, what actually is serving this application, it is completely client side. So we have the Webpack dev server that serves it. Um, I kind of, so I was showing this presentation to my wife last night, like doing a drive around, and I showed her Enrique's, and she was like, why doesn't yours have all the cool bling stuff that Enrique's has? Like, he totally should have done that. <laughs> and I was like, well, it's a node application. Like, it, it's actually using the technology. It's cool. She said, no, you you really messed up. So I was like, <laughs> okay, watch this. And so, Josh, can you pull up default.ls? So when you guys are working through the exercises, you'll see how awesome, well, I think Webpack Dev Server is amazing. But so Josh can just change like the background color. So get rid of like background and background size and just change the background color to red or something. Um, but there's no more like waiting 15 seconds for your code to be transpiled and then refreshing the browser afterwards. It just refreshes it on the fly. So he hit save and the application changes, it maintains state. So what happens is it will transpile your code again, inject that through WebSocket down to the browser and everything in the browser is instrumented to know how to accept these updates. So as we do our, um, our exercises today, you guys will get to use this and hopefully have an awesome experience doing that. Um, my wife was still <coughs> not impressed, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so this to-do list component, this is gonna be something that we consistently <coughs> revisit throughout this uh, session. So it's a basic to-do list, you can add things to it, you can say that they're done. Um, everything you would want in a to-do list. So we're gonna slowly build this uh, piece by piece um, and kind of we'll use that to show off some of the, uh, the parts of React here. All right, so if you were gonna write this um, in HTML, JS, CSS, this would be your HTML. Um, really standard stuff. You have your to-do list container, you have a header, an input, a button, and then you show off everything in the to-do list and list items. So I talked about JSX. JSX allows us to write our uh, our view, our HTML, in the JavaScript code. And you can see the only thing that changes is class becomes class name because you can't use class in JavaScript. But that's it. So how do we use this? We get to put it right in our JavaScript. So we can have a function that returns HTML, basically. So that gets rendered down using Webpack and the transpilers that we talked about. But So that's one thing that makes developing with this uh, incredible, right? But there's a problem. Browsers don't have JSX support. So there's alternatives, but they're not that great. So you can use React DOM, which React provides, and you can like manually create that entire that entire HTML structure. But you don't really get to see what it's going to look like at the end. It's hard to visualize. It's hard to work with. So we're all really upset about this. So how how can we do this? Babel. So Babel works with Webpack. Webpack is a Babel loader library that allows us to run our code through Babel, so our JSX through Babel, and get that ugly JavaScript that we don't want to write. 
Um, so Babel, just a little bit of background, was actually written by a high school student. Um, he was kind of bored in class and wanted to use the newer JavaScript features. None of the browsers supported it, so he did something about it. So he called it 6 to 5, um, and it's, amazing. it's an amazing tool. He got picked up by Facebook like everybody else, and he's working for them now. But, um, so not only does it allow us to use JSX, but it allows us to use some of these other uh, like brand new shiny JavaScript features that um, make React even better too. So this is just kind of like, you know, you have our JSX on the left, and this is what actually gets compiled down to, or transpiled. All right, so again, if we want to use this, we just return it in our JavaScript. Where do we put it? We put it in our React component. So the React component, like I said, is your, it's your Lego brick. It's your basic building block um, when you're using React. So a component is a, an object that extends React.component if you're using um, ES2015. Um, you can, they have like functions to do it in uh, regular JavaScript too, but I like this one. It's shinier and feels nice. Um, all right, so a React component only has one function that's necessary, and that's your render function. There's a bunch of other functions that we'll see, but if it only has this, it will run. So you can see here, to render that to-do list, just the HTML, it's not actually doing anything yet. We're just returning the JSX, and that'll get rendered to the screen. So you can see here, this is actually a really cool tool. It's called uh, Playground by Formidable Labs. So on the left side, we can put whatever code, and on the right, it'll render. So Josh, I don't know if you want to just change something really quick. But we'll, we'll, I just wanted to show this to you before we actually use it. So if Josh changes something on the left, it'll change on the right instantly. Uh, I'm inside the uh, yeah. Thanks. All right. So now that we know what our basic building block is, how do we break down our existing site into components? So for whatever reason, I chose my Amazon shopping cart. It's your standard Amazon shopping cart. I have a baby, and I have hair, and I have a wife. Um, but so what on this page makes a good component? Um, I kind of highlighted a few things here to start. So the nav bar is something that you're going to use on every page across your site. So you want, on every page, you want it to behave the same way, you want to use it the same way. So that's something that you can really encapsulate and create a component from. Um, the other ones, like I thought you might see a buy it again thing or a recommendations box on another page. Um, the pagination, page one of five. And then each little representation of each item that they're recommending to you or that you've bought before you might know how to render itself. So these are exceptionally good because we're reusing them everywhere. So you can see like the QRL is probably the exact same code, just with a very minor like parameter difference that goes into the bedding or the hair texturizer or whatever. Um, and then the add to cart buttons all look the same. So we could go crazy with this, right? We can make everything a component on the page. And it just really matters like how much you're going to reuse it as far as how much you break it down. So with our to-do list, um, I'm going to start just by grabbing the list items. We're reusing those, right? So that seems like a good candidate for our first component out of the to-do list. Um, if we were going to go further with this, maybe we have an input that we've used multiple places on the site or a button. So we're going to pull out the to-do list item. And Josh is actually going to do this as we go. So the pressure's on Josh. Um, so you can see he's going to make another React component. So to-do list item extends React.component. And he's going to use this component. So you can see it's, it's uh, trying to run around the fly. So he's going to get errors as he types. But that's OK. So he created the render function. That's the only one that we need. And now he's just going to return a list item. Um, and then we'll be able to use this to-do list item for each one that we want to render. Cool. So he's got his component now, and now he has to direct the other component to make use of this. So the awesome thing about components, they look just like an HTML element. So he can just use it in his JSX just like any other element that he would use. <coughs> so he just puts to-do list item for both of those guys. So he would. But um, yeah, that's good job. Awesome. So you can see he's got his two to-do list items. And they're each rendering the to-do list item that he made at the top. And you get your two list items go to the grocery store. Um, all right, so that's not 
extremely useful, right? We don't want all of them to say the same thing. So React has functionalities to do that. So there's two, there's two options. The first of which is this.props.children. Um, so in here, he can use a JavaScript expression within his JSX and the to-do list item, and he can reference this.props.children. And we'll talk about exactly what that is and how it works in a second. Um, but so you can see now it's empty, right? And that's because this.props.children is going to be whatever you get between those two to-do list item tags down in your JSX. So if you wanted the first one to be learn React, um, he would just put that inside of the two tags. And then if you, the second one I think was go to the grocery store. So you can see whatever gets put in between the two to-do list item tags, the opening and the closing tag, gets passed into the component as the stuff props that children, and then we render it there. Um, the other option, I think we just went ahead and put this one in there, is he uses this.props.description. So this is an alternate way to do it. You can see down on the to-do list item in his uh, JSX, he has a prop there called description, and he passes it the value that he wants it to render. So it's just two ways to achieve the same thing, and it really depends on the complexity of your component and how much you're trying to wrap stuff. Um, so one that like I would definitely use this.props.children, and we actually do, is, uh, sorry, Josh, can you click out of that? So each slide in this deck is a slide component. And then we're putting whatever the body of the slide is inside of the two tags. So it's using this stuff the children to render it. And you can see here, we took away the slide component, and it looks like crap, right? It, you don't get, so using that component, we get all the formatting, we get the background, we get everything that's described <coughs> in the component. All right, so we talked a little bit about props there. So what is a prop? So these are additional attributes to React components. They look just like an HTML attribute. Um, so, like our slider just mentioned has a title component, and that's actually what renders the props header at the top here. <coughs> so each one we say slide, title equals whatever, and it renders up at the top, because slide knows to do that. Um, so how do we use props? These are all accesses this dot props. Um, they're all, they all look like the HTML attributes, except for the special child prop. So here we have like a hello component who um, has a who prop and it says hello to whoever, whatever value is in that who. So down in the hello component, we might have hello, comma, and then the expression, this stuff, prop stuff too. So those expressions that I keep talking about, um, you can do, I mean, a, a React component, the class itself, is a regular JavaScript, right? So you can do whatever logic you want to, but then once you're actually in JSX land, like, and you're actual JSX, you can still use JavaScript within these tags. You can't have a ton of complex logic, like no traditional if statements or um, for loops or anything like that, but you can do simple um, one statement things, like a simple conditional there. All right, and then I mentioned the step props that children, and again, that's just whatever's between the tags gets provided to the component as the step props that children. All right, um, so last thing about props. Props are immutable, you can't change them, and React actually will yell at you if you do that. So in effect, Zuck is yelling at you. But so don't do like this.props.title equals a better title. Um, you, that's not something that you can change. So Josh, if you uncomment line seven in that file. Uh, where is it? Uh, Props3.jsx. Just use control T and then type props3. Yeah. And it's the only comment in there. So again, Webpack Dev Server is injecting the change to the client. And you can see you get a big red error. Like, this is not something that you can do. Um, perfect. All right. Any questions so far? Sir? Uh, what's the scope of this? Is it bound to the component or? It said the, the component class level. Yeah. So there are, and it gets funny because the lifecycle function, so like render, is automatically bound. But we'll see later, like, if you create an additional function, that's not automatically bound. So you do have to do some manual things to bind those functions. But yeah, so any of the React component lifecycle functions will be bound to it. I assume you're going to tell us how we can change the values of the properties the React or Yeah, so you actually can't. Um, right, so. The parent component can change them. So like, if I had that hello component or to-do list, I could change, or on the slide, I could change the title prop from the parent. But within the slide, you can't change the prop. So yeah, we will show how to change that from the parent or like in what situation that would occur. So yeah, good question. Anybody else? What's the name of the tool you're using? 
I'm sorry for the. What's the name of that tool on the page where you build code? Playground. Oh yeah, it's a playground. It's made by a company called Formidable Labs. Anything else? Cool. All right, so we're gonna get into our first exercise here. Um, again, these exercises are made to be pretty um, achievable building blocks, I guess. Um, and I think definitely with the help of the folks that raised their hand earlier, we can all get through these. Um, so our first one is gonna be, we have an existing Hello World component, and our management says that we need to be more modular. Like, having all that logic in one component is not acceptable. So we wanna say hello to multiple people, we want a world component that can take different names and um, put that on the screen according to what the prop says. So if in your Atom editor or whatever editor you're using, look at uh, hello world.jsx, and that's in source components, slides, exercise one. And then I won't flip it to the next slide yet. Um, I'll leave this up here for a second. But as you code, whatever changes you make are going to be displayed on the next slide in the deck after this. So the next slide just looks like that right now. All right, so I'll, we'll wait like five or 10 minutes and then come back and kind of get a feel for how everybody's doing. All right, so how did everybody do? If you got it, like just a show of hands real quick. All right, cool. So I think it, it'll be uh, worth walking through it really quick. Um, and so Josh will just type it up really quick. So for our step one here, we were going to create a hello component class. So this is basically, yeah, Josh, I think you got to make it hello or something right. different. Um, so this is just going to be a component that we'll be able to, after we create it, use it within the second hello world component, which is actually the one that we're exporting here. Um, so in effect, we're creating a custom HTML tag, sort of, um, that has an attribute called hello. So now that Josh has created this component up here, he's, re he's implemented the render function, which is the only one that you actually have to implement. Um, and now he can use that hello down here inside of his hello world component. So he uses it like an HTML tag with an attribute called who, and he set that to world. So we should say, we should see hello world on the screen. Um, so how does this who get translated up here? He's using this.props.who, <coughs> and that allows him to reference any attribute that was placed onto the React component. Yes, sir? How would I namespace hello? Um, we don't really do any namespacing on our projects, to be honest with you. Um, we just use the import function. Um, they're not all in the global namespace, and Webpack kind of takes care of that for you when you bundle it. Okay. So like, if you wanted to use this from another component, you would use it just like we're using slide at the top. So you can import slide from wherever. So we could have 50 different components <coughs> named slide, but it's only going to be the one that you've imported in that case. And you can rename them, you can alias them, um, whatever you need to do. So that's all, in this case, it's ES2015 um, functionality, but it's a good question. All right, cool. Any other questions about that exercise? Awesome. Um, all right, so components have another, uh, I guess, variable that goes into what, how they end up being displayed on the screen, right? So you have props, which are passed down from other components, and then you also have component <coughs> state. So component state is maintained internally within that component. Um, you can update it in reaction to certain events occurring or getting new data from the server, um, but they have state. So a component, the state you can access just like you access the props. It's this dot state. Um, state is immutable, and we'll talk about this. I'm going to mention it a few more times, and then we'll come back to it at the end. But you can't just change state. Um, you won't get an error, but you'll get funky behavior as your um, apps get more complicated. So you need to use this dot set state to change that. Um, I only mention it now because it's important, and we will use it later, but I'll go into why later, too. Um, all right, so your initial state, you can set that in the class constructor. Um, if you're not using ES2015, there's a get initial state lifecycle method where you would provide that, but here we'll use it inside the constructor. Um, as we talked about before, these are brought to you by Babel. You're going to see um, the super call a lot, just like you would in Java or 
anywhere else you have inheritance. Um, you just have to pass the props to the parent component. All right, so this is what state looks like. So we talked about you're going to initialize it within your constructor. So here, this is back to our to-do list. And rather than just storing that statically in the JSX, we want to now store those items in our state. So we can see we have an array of items. Let's see if I can use this pointer. Oh, yeah. All right. So we have an array of items. Each of those has a description and a Boolean that indicates whether it's been checked off or not. So it's pretty simple. Um, now we can reference that state in our render method. So this is where we get some more JavaScript logic within our render. So here you can see we are going to grab our items, and then we're going to render them down here in a JavaScript expression. So the items we're going to map. Basically, for each item in that array, we're going to create a to-do list item and pass in the description. And then that to-do list item will look at its children, see the description, and that's what's going to get drawn on the screen. So what the heck was that? That's very complicated. Um, we're going to break it down a little bit. So let me, yeah. All right, so this map function ends up giving you an array with two to-do list items. That's how many items we have in our state. So they get rendered to-do list item, learn React, to-do list item, groceries. So that's because that's the value of the item's description in each case. Um, all right, so then down further in the render function, we had the items referenced as a JavaScript expression. So really, that just gets expanded out so that each item in that array just gets placed into the, uh, into the <coughs> final markup. So you get your two to-do list items underneath the unordered list. And then that function notation that we saw with our map function, with the item fat arrow to do this item, is a uh, JavaScript, like a new feature. And this gets back to where we were talking about the context. Um, to be able to reference things like this.state and this.props within functions that you're mapping across an array, you need to have them bound to the React component. So this fat arrow just, in effect, turns into a function that, at the end, it gets bound to this context. Um, so yeah, you're going to see that a lot in React components. All right. Any questions about that? So, is that run some kind of app behind the scenes to get it, break it out into the individual list items? Is that what? So, when you see that list there? Yeah. Yeah, I think it just gets expanded. Yeah, it says if I see that array, I'm going to make each one of those items. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that's a good question. So, I had an interesting, interesting question from the gentleman back here um, on the last exercise. So, what can you put in your render method? It has to have one single parent element. Um, so, it can be a div, it can be a X component. It can be a span, whatever you want it to be. But if we tried to stick items in there and nothing else, that would get rendered out into two sibling elements, right? And React is, doesn't know what to do with that. So you do need to have something wrapping those. Um, any other questions? All right. So we're going to try to now apply the stuff that we just covered there. Um, I think it's kind of, it's fun for me to stand up here and talk about it, but it doesn't really help you guys as much as doing it. So our hello world component was received really well. Management really liked it. But now they don't want to just say hi to one person at a time. They want to provide a list of people and say hi to them all at the same time. So again, look for hello state.jsx, and that's going to be an exercise too. And again, the result will be displayed on the next slide. So how did, did everybody think last time was too much time, not enough time? No opinions? All right. Yeah, we'll just get a feel for it in a couple minutes then. Cool. So let's, let's uh, get started here again. I think I'm taking up too much time so far. So. All right, so we're going to again go through the solution. And I'll mention, um, I'll try to cover a couple issues that I think people ran into from what I heard. Um, so, did you already do it? Yeah. Oh. Uh, down here. Yeah. All right, so we're going to um, apply that same map function to get all of our names out of the array and get them put into our hello components. Um, yeah, you're good. So you can see Josh is creating the low components with the who attribute, and he's going to pass in the name, each one, and create a, a component for that. And then down here, he's just going to um, add those hellos to the JSX that's getting returned. And again, that gets 
um, expanded out into each hello. So it should say hello to all four people. Now, one thing that I think a few people did is, I guess they got to here and then they tried to change the names. So Josh, can you add another name up there in the initial state? So we'll talk about this a little bit more later too. So this is where we get into the component life cycle. Um, so you can see he didn't get an additional name that says hello Mark. Now if he reloads the page, now he should get his additional name. All right, so what's happening here? This is a uh, React lifecycle thing. So that constructor only gets run once before the component gets mounted on into the DOM. Um, that's, that doesn't get run again until it gets unmounted. So the state is just initialized once there. Um, there are other ways to update the state that we'll cover in other parts of it, but that's why you guys are running into that. Yes, sir? So I tried to comment out the hello who equal rule. Okay. And I just put not this guy, that one there? Or this one here? That one that one, the bottom one. The bottom one? Okay. Josh, can you put a comment there? Did you use uh, two slashes? I tried that and it just rendered two slashes on the page. Okay. So this is um, something that I should mention too. If you want to put comments inside of your JSX, you need to use a JavaScript expression. So Josh, can you show the way that we would do this? And you actually have to use the slash asterisk um, comment form. So Josh, change your double slash to a slash. Sorry. That works too. But, um, oh, but oh, if you put it on the next line. In, okay. a, yeah. in an expression. Yeah, so good find. Yeah, so I, if you guys can't see it, see low down, it's a slash star comment notation within the curly braces. So, good question. Any other questions about the exercise? All right, awesome. All right, so I think as we saw here, as people tried, like having constant state isn't extremely useful. Um, in most cases, we're gonna want to update our state and have more of a dynamic component. So like our to-do list is impossible it's not possible to add more items or mark things as done if your state is just done from the beginning. Um, so the way that you can do this is use that this.setState function. So for this, we're going to use this counter component. And this will be how we demonstrate this guy. So every time Josh clicks it, set state gets invoked, and we update the counter. So Josh is clicking really fast, and it's updating really fast. Um, so what does this actually look like? Our counter component has, again, a constructor, and we set the initial state. So our initial state just has one attribute, counter, and it's set to initial value of zero. So then to update that, we're not going to do this. It's possible, but it will mess you up big time in the long run when you least expect it. So we'll talk about why later, but just remember that. Instead, you want to use this.setState. And when you invoke this function, you basically just pass it a, an object that reflects your state, and you just you can only include the uh, attributes that you want to update. So you don't have if we had other ones like counter and name and something else, we wouldn't have to do all of those and pass their current one. It'll just take that and apply it to your current state. So in our set state, we reference the current state and increment it by one. So where do we put this? So this is where we get back to our fat error function and why this is helpful in React. So by default, if we had another function in our React component called increment it wouldn't have this bound to it, so it couldn't reference the current context. So this.state.counter is only, we're only able to reference that and this.setState if we use the fat arrow function, if we explicitly um, bind it in our constructor, or if we bind it at invocation time. All right, so then our uh, state is then referenced by this.state.counter, so that's how it gets displayed, just like we did with the previous exercises. The new thing here is that on click function, um, or attribute attached to the button div. So basically, on click is executed every single time that they click on it, right? It's not a big surprise there, but we can pass our function this dot increment that we just saw previously, and so that'll be invoked anytime they click on the button. All right, so we're gonna do an exercise to try this guy out, try updating state. So basically, our customer for the counter is extreme. He's not satisfied with just clicking it and incrementing it by one. So we want to both decrement the counter, so that's just subtracting one, and we also want to be able to change the amount that it's being incremented and decremented by. So we're going to have a text box that allows you to type in a number, and then we'll use that number to increment and decrement the value. Um, so to do this, 
for that text box, that input box, we're going to need an additional uh, tool in our toolbox. And so that's this on change um, function or attribute. So on change is invoked every single time your input changes. So each time you type a character, on change is going to be called. So again, you just pass it a handler. All right. So the file that we're going to do here is counter.jsx, and it's in exercise three. Um, <coughs> yeah, go for it. All right, so I think everybody did pretty well with that one um, from the people that I talked to. So, Josh, do you want to um, go through it real quick? Sure. So, if you just uh, counter that, just like. Yeah, it's just decrement is the first one. All right, so our decrement function is uh, it's going to behave exactly the same as the increment, except we're subtracting one instead of adding one. So here we'll use that set state function again to react to provides to update our state. Um, and now, hopefully, we can decrement. What did we do wrong, Josh? We're down. There we yeah. go. Awesome. All right. So that was step one. So step two was we want to change the change amount in our state. So that was with the input field. Every single time it changes, that on change function was invoked. And we can update the change amount to that new change amount that we're pulling out. All right. And then the last step was to actually use that within increment and decrement. And I think that was the, the problem that a few people got stuck on. And that's, that's more of just me needing to put like step three and step four. Um, but we, we're all learning. And then we should be good. Yeah, so I, I told a few people, we gave this talk um, last week, like just in-house to business, and it went terribly. Um, <laughs> basically, I, like I didn't prepare anyone for any exercise. Like the second exercise was build the to-do list, and it was just, it was awful. I couldn't even build it up there standing by myself, so <laughs> it's going a little bit better today. All right, awesome. Ready, Dash? All right. So, like I just said, the to-do list, um, I think it is a great way to show a lot of these examples, but it's a little bit tough to actually like have everybody build. So I figure we'll just walk through the last couple things that you need to know together. And then if you guys want, go home and, and try to do it yourself. Um, so back to our to-do list. There's a few more things. So one that is more of a convenience thing than anything else is the reps. And then array that can cat and deep copy are going to allow us to update our nested state in a way that isn't going to, um, we're not going to violate that immutability constraint. So this dot refs, and Josh, can you blow that up a little bit? So in your render function, if you just put a ref attribute on any element in there, that you can then access via this dot refs and then whatever you named it. Um, so that allows you to get a handle on those components very easily if you needed to do anything with them after they rendered. Um, so in our to-do list case, when we fill in the description and click the add button, it's not the same as the change event that we use there. There's no event that's being fired that we're going to get the value from. So after the to-do, after the add button is clicked, we go and fetch the value from um, the input using that ref. So um, array that can cat is more of a convenience thing. So a lot of the array functions that are available in JavaScript actually return a new array. So you can perform whatever function that, whatever operation that you need to on an array of items and not worry about violating the immutability constraint. So in this case, if we wanted to add a new item, we would want to add something to that array. So rather than using like this.state.array.push, we can just use concat. So that's just going to add a new, a new element to the end of the array. And we don't have to worry about Mark Zuckerberg getting mad at us. All right. Um, so the other thing, there's a lot of these tools that allow you to work with the immutable objects that React expects. Um, the one that we kind of use on projects all the time, almost exclusively, is ImmutableJS. Um, and I think Facebook has really put a lot of weight into that. Um, so it seems to be the way that a lot of people are going. The one that we're going to use here is Deep Copy, just for its simplicity. And um, React add-ons update was one that I think a lot of people used 
when React first came out. And it has a little bit of a wonky syntax. I mean, it works perfectly fine, but I just prefer the other ones. Um, so deep copy basically is a function. You pass it whatever, and it creates a deep copy. So now we're just uh, we can just operate it on on the object, the copy, like any normal JavaScript object, and then set the state with our new values. So when we mark something is done, we can get the index that we're marking done, and uh, just set that done to true. The state will get updated, and then it'll get rendered with a line through it. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're not going to go um, back through this, but the final to-do list, the version I came up with, is available on the source. So if you guys wanted to go home, start with a pretty basic one and see if you can work up to that with the tools that um, we've kind of just mentioned. All right, so I keep saying this, and I am going to talk to you about it. So why do we use set state? Why does that have to be immutable? So the reason is the component lifecycle. Um, the React component lifecycle is captured here. So like the problem that um, we were having where people were updating state in the constructor and then it wasn't re-rendering, that's because you get all of these before your first render. So that's get default props and get initial state and component will mount. Get initial state, like I said, we were just using it in um, the constructor when we set this dot state. But so that never gets run again after the initial rendering. Um, so that's all part of like the mounting phase. And there's really four phases here. Um, you have render, mounting, updating, and unmounting. So if we go back to this, you can see the render gets called down here at the bottom and up at the top. So a lot of things can happen in between there. If your props change or your state changes, you get a pretty valuable function there that actually is really useful in performance games. So that's called component should update. And this is also where that um, set state, actually that's not where set state comes into play. But that'll allow you basically to say, like short circuit the entire operation. This does not need to be updated because I know that prop doesn't actually matter in terms of what gets rendered to the screen or something like that. Um, so that saves you a lot of time, even though React is pretty good at evaluating what needs to be pushed to the DOM, um, it can save you even more time there. Um, the other one that I wanted to call out here that we're going to use in our last exercise is Componented Update. So Componented Update gets invoked after React re-renders your component. And, and there, you can do some checks, basically, to operate on the DOM afterwards. So you can say, like, oh, if this part of the state updated, I need to recall this semantic UI function to reinitialize my dropdown, or something like that. Um, so if you're trying to check if that updated and you mutated your state, it, you're going to say, oh, it's an update. I don't need to do anything. And you're going to wonder why your, your function or your dropdown is not working or why something didn't render or something like that. Um, yeah, so try to see if I didn't miss anything there. All right, and like I said, componented update gets invoked after the updates are flushed to the top. And we are going to kind of misuse it in the next exercise. But just because I wanted to introduce another um, part of the life cycle and kind of string this out a little bit. Um, so we're going to compare this dot state to previous state. And if you've mutated it, like I said, you're going to run into problems in the exercise. All right. So again, our customer is extreme, and they've thrown out all of the previous things that we made for them. So they don't care about saying hello to people or about clicking a button to increment a number, surprisingly. So they now want to be able to multiply two numbers. So with this one, we're going to have like two input fields, and you can type in one number, another number, see the product. So we are going to have some bonus points here. So the bottom one is kind of boring. It's pull out and reuse the factor component. Our really exciting one is the classic visbug problem. So if uh, your product is divisible by 3 or 5 or 3 and 5, we want to not show the number, but show fizz, buzz, or fizz buzz. Um, yeah. So, we have a file in there uh, stubbed for you guys to get started, multiplication.jsx, and that's in exercise four. And again, your result is on the next slide. Oh, yeah, and it is past six, just to let you guys know. So, thank you for staying. And uh, guys, I did want to say before everybody leaves, I have another slide and I'll talk about it again. But we definitely we want to do this again, um, and we don't want it to be like a visionist thing. So if you guys have 
any React topic that you're interested in learning about, anything you want to hear other people talk about, any topic that you want to talk about. If you have, yeah, um, 10 minute lightning talks, two hour comprehensive tutorials on the most complicated thing you can think about, or if you are really passionate about React and you have a poem you want to share, um, we're into that too. So come on, come on. This is definitely something that we want to be a community effort and share with everybody. Um, yeah, and you can get on the last side of this our email, reactivisionistink.com, if you have any feedback. Um, I definitely need feedback. This is not something I do a lot. So, But I know we're all interested in how the event went. Um, anything you want to change, any suggestions, any way you can help, we're definitely into that. So, all right. We'll go back to the exercise, but one, one little bit I want to add. If you are leaving and leaving early, please feel free to grab some pizza or some cookies or some fruit. Take that with you. And I think that Mark and Enrique deserve a round of applause. And Josh. <laughs> oh, yeah.